Hello, everyone. I'm Major General Retired Clay Hupmacher, the President and CEO of the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Thank you for joining us on our series of Soft Spoken with Quiet Professionals. Today, we have Major Retired John Corrin joining us to provide his insights and observations from Operation Eagle Claw as a tactical member of this operation uh, that took place over 40 years ago. John Corrin, like me, is a Mustang uh, that started out as, a, uh, as an enlisted man and then worked his way up to the officer ranks. He was in for 27 years. He is a Vietnam veteran with four tours in Asia. He conducted air to ground operations in Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand, the Philippines, and South Korea. John enlisted in 1969 and achieved the rank of Master Sergeant. He completed his bachelor's degree, attended Air Force Officers Training School, and was commissioned a second lieutenant in December of 1980. He was also an original member of the prototype special tactics team known as Brand X, which ultimately led to our special tactics force that we have the finest on the planet. That Brand X was dedicated to the U.S. military counterterrorism mission, our CT mission. This led to his participation in Operation Eagle Claw in April 1980, the attempted rescue of American citizens held hostage in Iran. During the months of preparation for that mission, John was a tactical planner and operator on the various training scenarios. He also deployed to the Pentagon for actual mission planning. John's specific duties on the rescue mission included rapid reconnaissance and layout of the Desert One landing areas, aircraft marshalling and backup aircraft air traffic control communications. Had the rescue mission succeeded, his team's duties on day two included seizing and controlling the Iranian exfiltration airfield with the Army Ranger Force. As an officer in the uh, Air Force, John had the following assignments. He was an instructor at the Air Force Special Ops School at Hurlburt Field, Commandant of the Air Force Combat Control School at Pope uh, Air Force Base, North Carolina, Director of Operations, 24 Special Tactics Squadron, J-3 Operations, uh, U.S. Special Operations Command at McDill Air Force Base in Florida, and he all, commander of the 321st Special Tactics Squadron in Mildenhall, uh, United Kingdom. John's got a Bachelor's of Science degree from Southern Illinois University. He's, he's a graduate of the Air Force Officers Training School, Master's of Science in Public Administration from Troy University in Alabama, a graduate of the U U.S. Air Force Squadron Officer School at Maxwell and the U.S. Air Force Command and Staff College. As a, a, John's military uh, awards and decorations include, he's a master parachutist with a combat jump star, military freefall parachutist and jump master, combat diver, a recipient of the Bronze Star, five meritorious service medals, three air medals, two joint service commendation medal, and a joint service medal, a joint Vietnam service medal with three campaign stars. Since John uh, has left the military, he's with volunteers for various uh, nonprofit programs, uh, military outreach team at Fort Worth, Texas, chapter of the Project Management Institute. Uh, John has also been a huge supporter of the Special Ops Warrior Foundation in the Dallas area, and we are forever grateful for what he's done for us. John is uh, currently working as a director of IT project management with a healthcare data company in Dallas, Texas. John and his wife, Nancy, live in Euless, Texas. I'm not sure if I pronounced Euless right, but uh, so that is a very impressive career, John, 27 years, uh, you know, uh, both starting out on latrine duty and ending up as a uh, squadron commander in the STS community. So congratulations to you for a successful career and thanks again for all you've done and continue to do for the Special Ops Warrior Foundation. So I've got some questions for you, but before we get started, I wonder if you would take a minute or two just to uh, talk about that stained glass backdrop in, uh, in, your, uh, in your photo there. Sure, thank you very much, General Hotlocker. I appreciate that. Uh, the window behind me is the stained glass memorial window at the Herbert Field uh, Chapel at Herbert Field in Florida, in the Panhandle of Florida in Fort Walton Beach. And it was installed about two or three years after the 1980 Desert One Iranian hostage rescue mission to uh, memorialize and remember those eight that we lost. We had three Marines, John Harvey, George Holmes, 
and Dewey Johnson. And then we had five Air Force personnel that perished on that mission. Richard Bakke, Harold Lewis, uh, Joel Mayo, Lynn McIntosh, and Charles McMillan. And so the stars in the ribbon flowing up to the heavens uh, are those eight stars uh, of the folks that we lost on that mission. And uh, it serves uh, as a uh, enduring reminder of the uh, courage of those who died and then the uh, fortitude and dedication of a modern day special operations force that we have right now uh, that's doing hard things for America uh, in harm's way. So I was, I was very be proud to be part of that back in 1980, but certainly the force today is uh, uh, very much more capable than we ever were. Hey, thanks for that, John. You know, I, as we talked before we started the, uh, this uh, webinar, um, that I was stationed in Hurlburt as an exchange pilot from 92 to 96, and I drove by that chapel many times and saw that stained glass and had no idea of the significance. So, so thank you for that. Okay, my first question for you is, uh, Brand X, uh, how did you get selected for Brand X Special Tactics Team? Great question. Um, and it was a prototype of the current special tactics teams that are in the, in the system right now, now um, emerging as Air Force Special Warfare. So they're going through some changes in names and titles of the units that we were part of that prototype unit way back when. So in 1977, we were brought up to Mil Military Airlift Command up at Scott Air Force Base, and they brought about 30 of us up there and uh, they asked us uh, if we would like to volunteer for a compartmented secret mission. Can't tell you anything about it. <laughs> and, uh, and it was classic, uh, almost James Bond type of stuff. But uh, everybody, of course, volunteered. And that speaks well for everybody that was there. And we were basically uh, from the combat control teams that were spread throughout the Air Force in different commands at that time. Remember back then, we did not have our special operations organization in one big umbrella like it is today. So then I suspect we continued on with different missions that we were uh, supporting uh, the two uh, competing uh, army units for hostage rescue missions, Blue Light and Delta. And we would do uh, new tactics in putting on traditional combat control missions. We would jump in before the force, we would seize airfields, and uh, we would uh, get new, type of new types of equipment, special tactics were employed. So uh, we knew we were a prototype, and so we started our calling ourselves Brand X, and I think Mass Sergeant Pete Holt, who we affectionately call Agent Oren Orange, coined that phrase. <laughs> and. Uh, as we consolidated through the missions, the Air Force decided to bring a core capability to Charleston Air Force Base. Because prior to that, we came from all the air bases in the United States, where John Carney in his book, No Room for Air, talked about how he would have to talk to all the wing commanders and, and, and lean on them and say, we can't tell you what your people are gonna do, but we need them right now. And they need, you know, your best players need to come with us. I suspect that I was, I was selected to uh, consolidate at Charleston Air Force Base based on my Southeast Asia history. We did a lot of uh, close air support and forward air guide duties back then. We broke a lot of new ground there. And uh, when we got to Charleston, we had a core team. And uh, we were certainly augmented by other combat controllers, but we had a core team known as Brand X. And we were able to, uh, and that occurred in 78, and so on every single mission that went on, it was high operations tempo and uh, it was tough. Yeah, but we, we were there, we knew we were on the cusp of, of new capabilities and we wanted to be part of it. So it was, it was an honor and certainly we had one great leader, John Carney at the time. And uh, we had some great uh, non-commissioned officers and uh, Mike, uh, Mitch Bryan, Michael R. Bryan, he's, I call him my half brother. He was our leader at the time, along with uh, now Chief Mike Lampy, retired. And uh, of course, we knew uh, those folks from different missions and we would follow them anywhere. So that's how we evolved with Brand X. Well, that's fascinating. I had no idea. And I've done a fair amount of reading on uh, 
Eagle Claw and Desert One. So thanks for that. And I mean, the, the work that you and John Carney and the whole team uh, did back then has obviously led to the, the uh, unmatched capability that we have now in our special tactics uh, community. So can you describe um, your role on Eagle Claw, the preparations as a tactical planner and, an, and as an operator, please? Sure. And I was a technical Sergeant E6 at that time. Mm. And all of a sudden, I was exposed to high-level mission planning in the Pentagon, very compartmented, very secretive. And I brushed shoulders with four-star General David Jones, who was at the time chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was a four-star general for over 13 years. He was quite iconic individual. And we worked with a lot of Army Special Operations uh, operators. And I got down to tactically planning our role on the different scenarios that we were looking at uh, to go deep into Iran and rescue our people. And so it was an honor. It was tough because we were back and forth from planning to going out to the West and actually performing the missions and operating on the missions. And I would have my normal position there as a uh, combat controller, establishing airfields, putting in navigational points, uh, infiltrating to uh, remote sites uh, where the mission depended upon us. So it was back and forth and it was an intensive five month workup throughout. So from the time the embassy went down in November, early November of 1979 to when we executed on April 24th, it was, it was difficult on families. Mm -hmm. We knew that this was mission, this mission was the most important one to us and we wanted to do it right. Well, I will tell you, transitioning between tactical planner and operator, uh, looks like you were getting your staff time early in your career <laughs> as, a, uh, as a tech sergeant. So uh, my understanding is you were on the, uh, you were on the first plane in to Desert One and on the last one out. Uh, can you give us some, uh, some of your thoughts on the ride in and, uh, and the landing there at, the, uh, at Desert One at the refueling site? Sure. Uh, Bob Brency, a retired colonel, uh, was our uh, lead pilot on that combat talon, MC-130, that penetrated and led in other aircraft. But we were first uh, by about an hour pre preceding the main force. And uh, it was about, if I remember correctly, about a four hour infiltration, low level. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were approaching Desert One, and ironically, we were packed in the back. And as we were approaching uh, the Desert One landing site, I was on top of a motorcycle strapped to the side bulkhead of, of the C-130. And that was not a bad seat to be on because uh, the other seats were on the floor, not all of them padded. And uh, sometimes it gets cold, sometimes it gets hot, but it was very hot when we arrived at Desert One. We did make two or three go arounds because there was actually some traffic that evening because we had a road that bisected the north and the south landing zones. Uh, and it was smuggler traffic, uh, remote traffic, uh, and intelligence stated that there could be some there, but we did not think there would be some there. When we did land uh, and we remotely activated the lights that Major Carney put in there uh, two weeks prior on a very, very courageous mission where they infiltrated in a twin otter working with uh, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and they brought him in to not only in place and bury special uh, light beacons, but he took some soil samples and brought it back we had to definitely ascertain whether or not C-130s could land there. And in fact, we proved that could happen. And uh, that advanced reconnaissance was key to the mission. So that was a very gutsy mission. So we went in, we landed, we landed very hard uh, because depth perception at night, under night vision goggles, and we broke new ground. The combat talent pilots broke new ground landing at night with night vision goggles on. And these were the first generation night vision goggles. Because as you know, those are very sandy, they're very irritating to the eye, and they're very myopic. You don't have a huge field of view. And so we hit the ground very hard on that, but 
uh, brought the, the aircraft to a stop and we rapidly left the rear end of the C-130 and I was on my motorcycle, started right up and I got the heck out of there. <laughs> uh, sounds like being on a motorcycle with shock absorbers was another good thing too. Uh, with having been on a Talon during a low level mission, I mean, it's, it, it's not optimum for the passengers in that particular, uh, uh, in that particular mode of flight. So a good segue here. So what did you and your team do when you got on the ground um, on this op? And what, was your, what were your duties and responsibilities? Sure. We had a seven-man team, and all of us had specific responsibilities. And we had to realign some of the lights on the southern side. And then we had to put lights out on the northern side to enable uh, aircraft to land. Plus, I was out there on the northern side heading from west to east doing a general reconnaissance to see if there was anybody out there. Uh, we were armed, of course, and I got actually outside of the perimeter. Once I got on the other side of the road, that's when the bus with approximately 44 Iranians came trundling down the road, and the, our Delta Force operator stopped it with a couple rounds into the engine compartment. And, uh, and I was on the other side of that, and I heard some of the rounds whizzing by, and I said, I got to get out of here. So I, to the um, eastern portion of the landing zone, we knew that we could land there. It was a vast expanse of desert, and everything looked real good. But we did notice that we had about four to five inches of loose, silty sand and dust. Anytime we got any uh, engines, uh, like C-130 engines, uh, blowing on it, we, we did just brown out. So we knew immediately we had bad dust conditions. It was about 90 degrees and it was hot and we had a vast, vast expanse of desert to land uh, the force on. So uh, having come back into the perimeter, I know the Ranger uh, road force or, or the uh, roadblock force we had out there on the eastern side held me up and gave me a challenge and password, which I forgot. And uh, they so they um, pulled their weapons on me, but I was able to convince them that I was one of them. <laughs> but that's a little known vignette that has never been cited in any of the books. And I got through the roadblock using um, some uh, different types of challenge and passwords. And uh, then I went back to our control point where we were setting up our TACAN navigational device. And once we had all the airfields lined up, we had the navigational device lined up, we had our command and control in position, we were there waiting for the rest of the uh, C-130s to come in and then the RH-53s. Oh, great. I mean, uh, when you encountered that ranger blocking position, I'm sure you ain't from around here, are you, boy? Comes to mind uh, with, uh, <laughs> with those guys. Can you, um, can you talk a, a little bit about what you saw on the ground with the collision between the uh, the 53, the helicopter, and the refueling platform, the Talon, the MC-130? Well, before I, I, I go into that specifically, I, I, I do want to state that these operations at night, under night vision, with blowing dust, with engines running, with aircraft landing, and we blew up an oil tanker as well, the, the uh, uh, Western road uh, uh, roadblock force hit an oil tanker with a law, and that was a smuggler. And the oil tanker blew up, and and we lost our night vision on the approach of the northern landing zone. And when we were landing those aircraft there, there was some incredible uh, decision making on the part of Mike Lampy and and others who were out there to ensure we didn't have any other aircraft collide with each other. We ran them pretty close. And getting back to the accident, we had to park the C-130s within 20 feet of the rotor sweep. 20 feet. That's because we were restricted by the hose length coming off the refuelers. And about three days prior to going into Desert One, we reduced the hose length as well because the pumps couldn't pump fast enough. So a Tactical decision was made to reduce the hose length. So now we have closer proximity of engines running at night with sand and heat. And it was very difficult. In fact, some of our teammates, the uh, type of uh, 
rudimentary night vision we had, they lost some of their uh, uh, eye, uh, uh, eyelets and they were actually looking at things with only one eye of night vision because these were not sturdy types of dust goggles or anything like that. So we had them very close and we knew we had to, the uh, mishap aircraft that Captain McIntosh was, was flying, uh, I was on that and we, we had to ascertain his fuel status. And he said he needed to get out of there or else he's going to dump it in the Persian Gulf. He said, okay. And we had to, we spread that around and we knew we had to maneuver some of the RH-53s away from him to allow him to taxi out. So the RH-53 that we had to move, he was told to pick up, turn left and come around to another uh, side where I would park him. Uh, so I got off the mishap bird and it moved over to where we were going to park this, uh, helicopter and the helicopter uh, picked up and then I did talk to the pilot of that and he, he indicated that the marshaller, one of the combat controllers may have moved and convinced him that he needed to go to the right and he was trying to follow him and, and that may very well be, but understand the rotor sweep and the, uh, and, and the horsepower of that engine, about 110 knots downwash and it would move anybody. But at the same time, we had a curtain of sand that would, would come up and we could not see through that. And it's very possible he could not see the marshaller's wand on, under night vision goggles. This is the part of the fog of war. And unfortunately, uh, the rotor uh, caught the crew engine door on the left side of the C-130 and we had the uh, terrible accident at that time. Yeah, truly a tragedy. A lot of lessons learned from that that, uh, you know, uh, as a result of that tragedy, we have benefited from. Was there any logistical challenges or that you faced or funding challenges? Uh, it's a two part question. And then two, if you had to do it all over again, I think obviously the spacing between the aircraft um, and hindsight's always 2020, right? So, and there, you know, there, this isn't disparaging anyone. You go with what you have and the knowledge you have at the time and the equipment. But would you do anything different on the Desert One layout? Well, we did practice other scenarios where we would be parachuting in and seeding the hard surface runway. But we knew that would have about 100 enemy personnel on there. So it would be a firefight from the moment we got there. Uh, and that was ruled out. Uh, and when I say that was ruled out, we have a command structure that made those decisions. Right. At my level, we were not part of those decision makings. We just did our best to execute what we were told to execute. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Everybody did that. Every single one of the folks that I worked with on the joint force did their best to make this happen. And we had the finest rescue force in the world. We had some of the finest aviator, aviators in the world and everybody did their best to make it happen. Now, when you look back at it, should we have used a C-130 Pathfinder much like 10 years previous at Sante that the Air Force and that Joint Task Force used that was in Sante, North Vietnam? That was a suggestion that was made in the, in the follow-on Holloway Investigation Commission. Or should we airdrop uh, refueling uh, bladders called blivets mm -hmm. that right as well? And uh, that turned out to be uh, somewhat unreliable because you cannot guarantee that these will land correctly. And then if they do burst upon impact, you won't have any gas. So the force was not equipped with air refueling throughout. And that's why we had to bring in C-130s with these large fuel bladders in the back end of the C-130 in order to refuel these helicopters. But nowadays, obviously, we have refueling capability for in-flight at night with helicopters, large helicopters and Ospreys, and we can do that. But at that time, we did not. So we had the scenario, we practiced it. Did we practice it 1000% in a thorough way? I would say no, because we did not have, we, we, we had a lot of operational security uh, issues to deal with. And I think looking back, uh, General Vaught, who was the, the Joint Task Force Commander, he was dealing with a 
system that did not use the standard military plan. We basically built an ad hoc plan on this because of compartmentation and secrecy. And that somewhat challenged our logistics and our support from various air bases in the, in the U.S. And so at times we had to use uh, persuasion to uh, get people to do things for us. Uh, and, and that worked uh, through force of personality, through uh, blunt force of you will do it this way. But it probably could have been made easier. But again, operational security was, was key. And remember, every single night, we had on uh, the TV, we had TV shows like Nightline talking about how long the hostages were there. Yeah. And reminding the American public that it doesn't look very good for them. And that weighed heavily on everybody. And we knew we could get in, we knew we could get them rescued, and we knew we could get them out. But it was a high risk, uh, operation and uh, we unfortunately had that accident that came after the fact because we had one helicopter that aborted because of a backup flight control system and we needed six to move on six helicopters to move on from desert one we only had five and we did not have enough lift capability to continue the mission and that was the abort criteria at that time no, I, yeah, and that's all, I mean, I can, I can only imagine how hard that decision was. So I've got our last question uh, as we uh, come to a close here as a two-parter. So can you talk a bit about basically the epilogue when you get back to your uh, forward support base and then uh, add any closing thoughts? I mean, uh, clearly you've been associated with the families of those, uh, our eight fallen uh, warriors and their families, but any, uh, you know, again, the epilogue and any closing thoughts you have would be great. Well, we passed a hat to raise money for the surviving children. There was a small fund funding capability in place that ended up evolving in, in beginning the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. And uh, with, with a truly heroic mission of, of uh, taking care of the surviving children of their fallen warrior and guaranteeing a college education. Uh, and nowadays it, it's further expanded uh, upon counseling and, and handing out wounded warrior payments. So the, the Special Operations Warrior Foundation is very robust and evolved from very humble beginnings. And there was a need to create it at that time. We got back to our respective bases and we were dispersed basically uh, along the East Coast. And uh, we were told not to mention a thing about it. Everything was compartment. We were holding secrecy. But the news uh, people were boring in on this and finding information. And I myself, two weeks later, had a, had a call from my family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, saying, uh, well, how's everything going? I said, okay. It, well, we have this article on the front page of the Pittsburgh Press that you're mentioned on it with, a law, with, a, with another individual from the, from the Combat Talent Force. And I'm going, what, how did that happen? But it was a speculation article uh, that took advantage of, of uh, the goodwill of my family. And, uh, and they were good about it because we were a military family. And they said, well, we can't comment on it because uh, we don't want to get John in trouble. Uh, we also came back and immediately started planning our second attempt to go res rescue the hostages. And I was uh, proud to be part of that as well. Uh, prior to going to officer's training school. And we practiced that and set that capability up and which did not eventually, it did not get launched nor approved, but uh, it was a, a very robust capability, I might add, uh, for the second attempt because we were not gonna let things get in our way. So it was, uh, 1980 was an exciting year for me. Uh, not only did I complete my degree, I got promoted to master sergeant, and I went to officer's training school, and I participated on a rescue mission. And it was, <laughs> it was very difficult on the family, there was no question. Uh, but we broke new ground, and we established uh, an organization going forward that is the premier special operations force in the world. And we have the premier uh, special operations warrior foundation charity in the world. And, uh, and we support it to, through today. 
and uh, it was just an honor to be part of that mission. Uh, we, we felt we let the American public down, but it wasn't because we did not try. And uh, it's very possible that we have lost people had the mission executed through its entire profile. Nobody knows, but uh, it was a plan that was tenuous and it was courageous and it was very risky. And when you run risky plans, sometimes you hit that risk and go over the risk cliff. And that's what happened when we had a, a close proximity of aircraft. But it was, uh, it was exciting to prepare for it. It was exciting to be on the front end of that. And it was exciting to uh, reap the fruits of that in my uh, follow-on special operations career. John, that was fascinating, and and uh, and and thanks uh, for those insights. Many things, most things, I have never even heard. Um, uh, and I'd like to, you know, give a shout out to a couple of people. One, uh, John Carney is uh, our first SOWF uh, president, uh, who did absolutely fantastic work. is a is a hero in his own right, as you uh, pointed out, uh, and in what he did while he was wearing the uniform, but he also continued his service here with the Special Ops Warrior Foundation and set the foundation for the success of, uh, of the organization today. Um, and so I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, at, before we sign off, I also got to give a shout out to Allie Olson, who is our social media extraordinaire. Her own, I suspect it would not have went as smoothly. So. Uh, but thanks very much, uh, John, for, uh, for, sharing, for sharing this time with us and the insights from uh, Desert One. And everybody out there, thank you for joining us uh, for our soft-spoken series with Quiet Professionals. So thank you all very much. Thank you.